welcome to another episode of Let's Tech. Today is going to be more or less a part two of a previous uh, video that we did, uh, that I did, that uh, dealt with remote app and how to set one up in your on-premises data center. So I'm going to expand that out to the cloud now. So what we're going to be doing today is actually uh, covering how to create a remote app server in Azure. Uh, this is going to have a lot of benefits for you. If um, you know if you need to do remote app work with people spread across multiple geographies, uh, you can put that out in the cloud. Plus, it's a great way to get into the cloud if you've been kind of wondering and looking around for ways to get you know a uh, a footprint in the cloud. You know, getting an idea of how to you know put stuff out there. Um, Azure has a really easy way to set this up. Um, rather than just standing up a VM and configuring a network and configuring a you know VIP and a whole lot of other things like that, there's kind of a, a pre-built set of steps uh, that are relatively easy, but uh, do require some little gotchas that I'm going to kind of show you here on how to set this up and uh, you know get yourself a a functioning remote app server out in the cloud uh, that you and your users can use. Uh, also, I've got a bit of a cold. Actually, it's more allergy related, so sorry if I sound a little nasally, more nasally than I typically do uh, today. That's uh, uh, not any fun, but it's, uh, as of this filming, just starting into spring. As much as I am really happy that the warmer weather's coming back, I, my allergy and sinuses are not real happy with that. So you don't actually start here at Remote App, where you would probably think you would. You're going to start up here at virtual machines. This is the easiest way to do this. Now, there's obviously a lot of different ways uh, that you could set this up. This is probably just like when I, I showed you the all-in-one before. This is kind of a, a, a super simple way to set yourself up a remote app server that is maintainable by you, uh, not locked down where you have to upload a new gold image every time you need to uh, build a new one. What you're going to do is start by um, uh, creating a new virtual machine and we're going to do a uh, uh, gallery VM because the Azure team just a little under a month ago added us a new one that we could use specifically for this purpose. So we're going to go from gallery and we're going to pick this one here called remote desktop session host. So this is the remote app team's uh, image that has been uploaded to, for you. We click next and then you'll notice that they uh, they have a 3.9 release date on this uh, so yours is going to always select the most recent one so uh, these will have more recent patches and um, and any uh, gotchas that they've found out there with this process uh, will have already been done uh, and fixed for you on here so always pick the latest release unless you have a, a good reason to do otherwise and then we'll get we'll give this thing a name so uh, we're gonna we're gonna call this uh, the uh, 9z wait a minute I'm on uh, which one man I was uh, let's call this remote app uh, RA uh, test 9z1 or something like that. Right? I'm going to pick standard. Now there are two different ways that we could uh, put this out uh, and build it, but with a, a basic account it's an A0 VM, so if this is just for your testing purposes that might be useful, but a standard you see is a 4 core 7 gig box and for doing any, you know, you know any heavier workloads you might want to go with a, a little bit bigger box you might even want to pick one of these big servers right you know 32 core with 448 gigs of memory might be a bit of overkill but who knows what it what your process might uh, be also there's another difference in the basic and standard and that's going to be in the pricing uh, model for Azure remote app and this is worth taking a look at because it's it's a little bit uh, confusing. It took me a little bit to figure this out. But so what you're going to be getting is uh, starting price per user per month is ten dollars for basic. But you'll notice that the user cap is seventeen dollars per month. So if you're just doing some testing or setting this up for yourself, and you're doing this maybe on your MSDN account, um, you know, you might do basic, and it's only going to use seventeen dollars of your hundred and fifty dollar allowance that you get through the MSDN, or twenty three if you want to do a uh, you know a, a full on standard information worker version of this. So there's two reasons why you might pick either basic or standard. So we're going to go with standard. We're going to do a 4 core 7 gig and uh, I'm going to go ahead and give myself a username and a password and then we're going to click this uh, the forward arrow. 
Now it's going to ask if we want to create a new cloud service or use an existing one. Now I don't have a cloud service built here, but obviously if there was one, we could go ahead and um, you know piggyback on one that we'd already created. Basically, that is a public IP address and a container, more or less, for where you can get to this thing from outside of Azure. Um, I'm in the South Central U.S., so pick your data center uh, storage account. It's uh, it's going to go ahead and build one for you unless you have a storage account that you want to piggyback on and then um, we can create a new availability set but that gets a little beyond the uh, point of to the scope of today's presentation you'll see that it's already gone ahead and giving you the uh, RDP port and uh, PowerShell port so that you can use uh, Azure PowerShell and you could go ahead and add additional ports in here if, if you needed so then we we click forward and here are some extra stuff so for instance if we wanted to put like um, you know Microsoft's uh, virus protection on this thing it would go ahead and, and put that on there but to keep things simple we're just going to leave all of the extensions turned off on that except for the VM agent so we, we really kind of need that so let's leave that on here this gives you the summary we're going to click the uh, checkbox and you can see it's going to go ahead and start provisioning you'll see that it's staying stating down at the bottom that it is now creating the virtual machine. We can even click details and see what it's doing. So there's really three or four steps to this. They work rather relatively quickly because we're building this from a template. Uh, so what we're going to do is go ahead and pause the video at this point in time and uh, then we'll, we'll pick this back up again uh, once it's finished provisioning this virtual machine and then we're going to do some stuff to it before we actually turn it into a remote app server and I'm going to go through some gotchas that some things that you really want to do uh, before you uh, create this and I actually realized that I had just made a mistake it's not a really big mistake but when I created the username you'll notice that I used the uh, username of Chris later I'm going to wish that I had actually used something like Chris2 for this process so make a mental note if you're making kind of some notes on steps on how to do this or playing the video back later as you're building one uh, don't call it the name you want to call it like um, you know if I were to uh, uh, be using the username of Chris in this case I would use like Chris A B C or Chris 2 or something along those lines but uh, we'll we'll work around that it's not a really big error it won't uh, cause a problem but just make a mental note that that's what we're going to do uh, so anyway, this thing's cooking along pretty quick here, and uh, actually we may not need to pause the video because it's already uh, starting that virtual machine up, because it's already built the virtual machine. This is one of the things I love about Azure, is it just does not take me very long at all to uh, to get stuff started in uh, you know, whatever project I happen to be working on at, at, at the time. Okay, so I did end up going ahead and pausing that. It ended up taking about five minutes longer than I expected it to, but it did provision pretty darn quickly, and it's up and it's running, as you can see right there. We've got ourselves a VM. Now, right down here, this is the important piece, right? So, um, obviously, the next thing we want to do is uh, get in there and look at our VM. Uh, so what we've done is we've, we've taken a virtual machine, and we've um, basically just... Uh, set it up using the delete, or the default rather, gosh I, I can't talk and, and pay attention to things anymore. Um, let's just put this in here. Alright, so I'm going to edit this real quick just so it fits on the screen better by uh, taking that down to maybe like 1024 by 768 and uh, we're going to go ahead and connect to it. You see that it, it, it when you click that button, the connect button, it's going to go ahead and give you a pre-built um, you know, um, uh, RDP, remote desktop connection uh, thing here. So I'm going to go ahead and say dot backslash Chris and I'm going to go ahead and connect to it and tell it I don't care about the certificate not matching the name or not being trusted or whatever. I'll have to do that twice. And there's the other one. Okay, so where we're at now is about to be logging into the desktop on this machine. And clearly I shouldn't have used 1024 by 768 because it didn't fit on my screen very good. But as you can see, we are actually logging on to just a standard virtual machine. So the only real big things that the uh, folks over there at Azure Remote App did 
uh, was go ahead and install some roles on here uh, that weren't previously on it. So um, they've also given some uh, little PowerShell scriptlets once the desktop comes up. I'll show you what those do. Uh, but they've also made sure that the VM was built in an appropriate manner so that it actually uh, can become a remote app server. So we're going to go ahead and validate that now. So we double click this and we'll see that uh, it's going through kind of a miniature prerequisite checker to validate that it is uh, capable of being turned into a template. And it uh, there it goes. All right, current image satisfies all the requirements for Azure Remote App Template image. So that means we're good. That means that this one can be. But we're not done with this thing. So we're gonna we're gonna actually do a handful of things to this virtual machine before we get there. Um, you may have noticed that the uh, remote desktop licensing mode did not get configured automatically. That's going to change after you turn this thing into a template and after you shut it down and then uh, you know pull it in as a template to your remote app and then build a new remote app with it. At that point it will be managed by Azure but it will also be manageable by you. So we're going to do a few things on this uh, so that we can make it um, our own. right? So what are some of the things that we might want to uh, to put into our remote app image, for instance. Well, I can tell you right off the bat, um, you're going to want to have an administrator account that you can use to make changes to it later. So uh, this this is probably documented somewhere as something you should do. I haven't really seen that. Um, but you'll see that by default we already have a Chris in here. After you pull this into remote app, there's going to be another one. And uh, that other user that's going to be in there is how Azure is going to manage your remote app stuff for you. Uh, so uh, remember when I was saying that I should have called that Chris 2? Well, I didn't, so I'm going to actually call this one Chris 2. Chris 2 and give it a password as well because the Chris account is going to get converted into the Azure management account um, we're also going to go ahead and add that Chris 2 into the local administrators group There we go. So later I can log on after this thing's been sys prepped and I can still manage this VM. Rather than having to have a gold image that's just, you know, everything that I'd hoped it would be, um, and and have it uh, you know static and non configurable, and then every time we have to make a major change to this thing, I have to put a new one of these together and upload it. That would be a real pain. We don't want to update it that way. We want to be able to you know, in this particular scenario to manage it however we want to, whenever we want to. So a um, couple things like, uh, let's, you know, let's install Office. So I'm going to log into MSD and pull in an Office uh, ISO and kick off the install for that. Uh, so I'll pause the video for a second so you don't have to watch that uh, occurring, even though it's very, very fast. That's another thing you'll see as a benefit. Uh, Windows updates, if you do manage them yourself, can happen incredibly quickly in Azure because, well, it's on the Microsoft network already. Same thing when you download stuff from MSDN. Because it's all in the same data center, it comes down amazingly fast. Uh, so getting ready to install some software does not take very long. But I'm going to go ahead and cut that part of the video out. Uh, once I have the ISO downloaded, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, show you a little bit of a gotcha that you'll run into there. Okay, that downloaded. I actually counted after I clicked the download button, and it uh, it took right at two seconds. So not bad for an 850 meg file. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and mount the installer ISO. Um, I tried this uh, a few nights ago on another VM when I was setting up a, uh, a new remote app server. And it actually came down so quickly that when I right clicked and tried to mount the ISO, uh, it wouldn't mount because it actually hadn't, it was showing up on the desktop, it hadn't finished actually writing to uh, the desktop. It was still in, uh, you know, the disk was still caching. Why did that not mount? That's bizarre. Um, maybe I didn't actually do it. Temporary storage D, local C. Let's try that again. Mount. Huh. Okay. It doesn't like me. It could be similar to the issue I ran into the other night where maybe it said it has finished the downloading, but the disk haven't catched up actually writing the ISO to the drive. 
So let's right click and go to disk management and see what it sees. Maybe it is mounting a bunch of uh, ISOs, but it's not showing up in Explorer. And yeah, loading disk configuration information. That's pretty awesome. So yeah, loading disk config. Well, stop loading it and just do it. Silliness. Yeah, that's probably why the ISO is not mounting. You now when it does finish doing whatever it's doing here, it's probably going to do the. Uh, I mounted that ISO and then I attempted to mount it again, and it was already mounted. So we seem to have some disk latency that we're going to be waiting on. And before we um, actually go to the part where we pause the video to wait for this thing to fix itself, uh, we'll try a few things just for fun. So you can see there I tried to launch Task Manager and no joy was to be had. So now I'm going to right click and try to open the command prompt as admin. Right, I'm going to right click and I'm going to, I'm going to keep right, okay, wonderful. So this is the demo gods that hate me uh, because I've actually set, this is my third remote app server. Uh, the first one I built was not even with a template because I didn't have one yet. Uh, the second one was kind of a quick and dirty walkthrough of using this handy new um, pre-built template image, which that time worked great. And now it's going to be mean to me and it doesn't like me anymore. So we, we don't seem to have any response coming back from Explorer. I have to imagine we're dealing with a disk latency problem of some sort. And uh, we're going to do a control alt. I think it's end home. Yeah, I can't do control alt delete in the thing. So let's uh, let's close that out. It's possible my remote desktop session is actually what's dead here, and not the. Uh, let's see, do 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 twelve eighty by seven twenty. Let's see if that looks any better. I don't remember what the resolution of this thing is. Let's see if it's just my session that's dead. And if we have to, we can always use Azure to forcefully reboot this sucker. And we can walk through that too. For those of you who don't watch a lot of my videos, um, I don't believe... <laughs> Alright, so it was the remote desktop connection that actually was hosed and not us. I still don't like the way that looks. Um, let's edit that and reconnect to it again. And let's try 800 by 600. Uh, for those of you who are new to watching my videos, uh, I do not pre-script anything. I do not cut things out. Uh, that's why it's called Let's Tech. It's in the gaming um, mantra of a Let's Play. In other words, we're just going to put this out and we're just going to go through it. Uh, I have an idea that morning. I start filming and um, all troubleshooting will be left in. The only thing I don't do is any uh, grinding, as in if there's anything like downloading or some building VM that's going to take forever and it's just boring as heck. I won't torture you by keeping that in the video. But um, yeah, it was listening to everything. Uh, yeah, and couldn't mount the file because it was already mounted, yeah, just as I suspected. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was the remote desktop uh, session that was dead. But anyway, I leave everything in. Okay, so um, that's that's why uh, you'll see me intentionally have bad things happen in uh, my videos, because I think that's a much better way. You're not going to learn things unless you see other people have uh, problems. When everything's pristine and beautiful, which it never is in the IT uh, industry, there's you know going to be frustration when you hit it, and a lot of times we learn together. Okay, so uh, we're going to run setup, and here's our first gotcha. So as we start running this, you'll see that this says, this copy of Office uh, 2013 can't be used on a computer running terminal service. To use uh, Office 2013 on a computer running terminal service, you must use a volume license edition of Office. Uh, but that's not actually true. It will indeed let you. You just click OK, and then it says, oh, OK, well, go ahead and plug in your product key anyway. Now, obviously, it would be a bad idea for me to plug in my product key right in front of everybody here, so I'm going to pause, and I'm going to um, go ahead and put that in. OK, that's done. Make sure you click the automatically um, you know, activate. That way, it will activate while you're still in this kind of remote desktop mode. It's easy to fix later if you forget, but anyway. So we're going to go ahead and um, 
put this uh, copy of Office on here. To finish my thought from earlier, why are we doing this? Well, I'm trying to think of things that you might need to put on your remote app uh, install. Uh, first thing I always think of isn't Paint and Calculator, which are the ones that are built in uh, and allow you to publish. I don't think a lot of people are remote apping Paint or Calculator. They're probably uh, remote apping biz line of business tools, and they're probably remote apping um, you know useful things that their their people are going to be needing to actually do in a remote app type of session anywhere they are. Uh, so in this case, uh, I figure Link and Outlook and stuff like that would be would be good ones to, to publish. So I'm putting the whole Office suite on here. Um, I'll probably go ahead and throw some other stuff on here as well. Um, maybe, I don't know, I love Internet Explorer, but um, you know a lot of people like Firefox. So maybe we want to get Firefox uh, to be installed on this machine and have that remote app as well. One one neat thing that you can do by having a remote app server, uh, you can kind of use it like a proxy server in a lot of ways as, uh, come on man, oh we just do it right here. Silliness, MS MSN is not responding. Maybe that's why we need to put Firefox on here, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Wait a minute, I work for Microsoft, I'm not supposed to say that sort of thing. So Bing dot com. Will you behave better? Perhaps? No, you're not. You're not going to behave better. Maybe Google? Hate to say, no, they're all going to fight with me here. Apparently disk throughput today is something of an issue. Good. Good. Oh, let's try Bing again. Come on, man. People don't want to watch me having trouble just finding the Dagum downloader for Firefox. Gee whiz. All right, so we're going to do something here. I have got to know. All right, so we're going to do disk perf y or capital y or just dash y. And then we're going to do task manager and we're going to go to more details and we're going to go to performance there's it performance and okay so CPUs all four processors are fine we've got plenty of RAM committed bytes are fine disk is a little active on the C drive not so much on D and networking we're not even using network hardly at all here so um, of our four bottlenecks Let's see, we've got 300, this actually, somebody told me the decimal's wrong on the average response time, so even if we put that at, um, you know, 68, 71, yeah, so it looks like right now our throughput issue seems to be on um, the uh, the high side. And there's probably a reason for this, I actually opted for on my MSDN version of my Azure which is what we're running on right here to go to a dog food that is a heavily congested uh, kind of a free pod. This isn't uh, the type of performance I would expect to see out of the normal one. I have a different Azure account that's actually on a normal uh, commercial type of account and I uh, did not see these kind of problems for that. So that's probably what it is, it's probably because in Microsoft we all dog food new stuff and I can tell you that you know, with 100 dis uh, percentage of uh, activity during an install wouldn't be uncommon because, well, you're installing Office, right? There's going to be a lot of stuff there. <laughs> but um, doing that on probably a uh, very underpowered uh, back-end disk device, probably why we're seeing some performance issues here. So uh, until Office finishes its installing process, this thing's probably going to suck. And you guys don't probably want to sit and watch that, so we will pause until Office is complete, um, unless we can get the Firefox downloader. Is it really going to be that hard to find Firefox? Just, there we go. Find, uh, let's go ahead and just really load this sucker down and kick off the um, the installer for that, or download the installer at a minimum and get that on there. We've got a few things we can publish and a few things we can uh, put out there so that we can see the experience of remote app and um, 
All right, so it's running its security scan. It's extracting. All right, we should really be killing the disk uh, response times now. So um, there we go. Okay, so we've got uh, two installers running now, and uh, good time to pause the video and come back to this after we've got there so we can start talking about some of the next steps and some of the gotchas that I ran into the other night that you need to know about before you put one of these out there. All right, so it is finished, and we've got a um, copy of Office on here, and we've got a copy of uh, Firefox on here, just to save some disk space. We don't really need um, the, let's eject that, and then delete it. We don't need this taking up disk space when we're trying to build our template image and stuff, so try to keep this thin. And, um, Another little trick that I've read is if you'll go ahead and pin to the start any applications that you're planning on publishing, it makes it a little easier to find. I've uh, given people this advice because I read it, but um, I'm going to actually see if it does us any good or not. So we'll go ahead and do that and see if it actually makes that into, let's say we want to publish Word 2 and Outlook. And then we'll have our emails and our chatses and our browsers. And we've already got um, IE pinned here. So, all right, so there's some stuff um, that we have that are um, you know added in. So we've got past the gotcha of Office saying that it won't install, even though it will indeed install. And at that point, you'd probably want to go ahead and patch everything. So we can do that just obviously by going into um, system security and then running Windows updates. Now, I don't know that we're actually going to worry about this. I'm not going to teach you how to use Windows updates because that would be a bit insulting to you and it's also going to make the video much longer than it needs to be. But you should update to anything that you're going to put on here um, to the latest version. Uh, you also might want to throw in some stuff you don't think about right off. So if you're going to be using emails, probably not a bad idea to put, um, you know, Adobe Acrobat on here. A um, handful of uh, other utilities you normally would, you know, think about later when you're like, oh gosh, we can't do that. Because if your users that start using this start trying to open things or do things and it's not installed, they're not going to have admin rights to be able to uh, to do those later. So. Just kind of think of this as, as a desktop image more than a server image. That's the probably most important piece to that, uh, is remembering that um, you're, uh, you're building a server that is going to be used as a desktop for your folks, right? So let's take real quick a peek at the differences between this and just a vanilla image of Windows. So let's look at the roles and features that are on here. Um, maybe after it finishes that refresh. So you'll notice right here that click, click, um, obviously file and storage services, that's not uncommon. Uh, the only role it's putting on here is remote desktop session host. So if you're gonna wanna do this yourself and not use the pre-built image, that's really the big thing you gotta have. It doesn't necessarily have to be an image that is, uh, you know, the, the pre-built one that they, they've listed, but the remote desktop session host does have to be on here. Um, and then you want to do things like getting your .NET framework on your uh, uh, desk for your users and can handwriting services. Uh, and then you want to get, uh, where's it at, user interfaces and infrastructure. You want to go ahead and put the desktop experience on. All right, so little things like that. Uh, for those of us that are server people that are now providing a service to users as remote app, uh, we're really kind of treating the server a little bit more like a, um, a, des a, a desktop. Uh, and you can tell that this has been done without having to go through all this because the little store icon is down on the start menu and the store icon is in the, in the, in the uh, box here. So. Anyhow, that's uh, that's the biggies. So before we do anything else to this, uh, once again, you would uh, run Windows updates, and then when you're done, you want to rerun the validate image. So it says it still satisfies the requirement, so we're still good there. All right. So next step is to sysprep. So what we're going to do is we're going to type in sysprep. So I as prep, and then we're going to put an oob uh, out of box experience. So the ubi, and then generalize, and then shut down when it's done. And that's really about the last step in here. So we're going to go ahead and run the oops, sysprep. 
Exe. Is that where is that? Is it not in? Oh, it's in. Ha ha. No. Sysprep. <laughs> you actually have to be in the sysprep folder. All right. So what it's doing now is generalizing this image so that it can be uh, deployed as a uh, template and uh, getting it ready for um, you know kind of a rebuild. If you haven't done sysprep much, which I'm sure everybody who's watching this video has used it before, it, it's um, it's just generalizing the operating system so that when it boots up the next time it kind of goes through the mini setup wizard and creates a new SID and a whole lot of other stuff that makes it possible to deploy this multiple times. Even though we're only probably going to deploy this once uh, in, in most environments, there might be people who need to stand up multiple remote desktop uh, servers and you'll have this template that is always available for you to use for that purpose. So this is going to take a couple of minutes before it starts to shut down and we move on to the next step. So time to pause the video and I'll come back when it starts uh, shutting itself. Okay so the uh, remote desktop connection closed and um, the VM shut down and it um, is now in a stop state. So now we can do more interesting things with this. So you'll see this little button down here at the bottom called capture. So we're going to go ahead and click the capture button to capture this image. Uh, we're going to give it a little bit better, uh, well I guess that's a pretty good name. It's got the actual date. I don't know what all this stuff out here is. I'm sure it's maybe the build number or something. I don't know. But um, So we'll give it a, a, a description and we'll call it remote app template one. And this is really important. You need to say I've run sysprep on the virtual machine so that it will delete the VM. Now that's one of the reasons we want to get everything done with this before we go through the capturing process. Uh, so um, if you don't check this box you won't be able to import it into the uh, remote app on the next step. So we're going to go ahead and click that. You'll notice that it's now registering that and it's uh, capturing the image for us so that we can turn the uh, the virtual machine from being a virtual machine into an actual image. Uh, that's going to take it a couple of minutes and so we'll come back when it is complete and move on to the next step. And I was wrong, it wasn't a couple of minutes, it was actually a little under a minute, so it took about all of 30 seconds. So we'll go ahead and click OK. So you'll notice that Virtual Machines now shows zero, because we don't have any VMs anymore. What we have instead is an image of a VM. So if we go to Instances, there's no VMs. Images is here now, so we have a VM image that can be used uh, to do interesting things with. And uh, one of those is creating a remote app. So that's going to be next. Next. Um, sorry, had a phone call. Anyway, that's what we're going to do next. Okay, so um, uh, remote app. Go ahead and click on that, and you'll see you've got this link for create a remote app uh, collection. But we're not going there. We're actually going to go into our template images tab here, and we're going to upload or import a template. So you could upload one. So if you did everything I just did, but you did it on your own computer and uh, you, you know, sys prepped it and you've got it all shut down, you've got the VHD and it's sitting somewhere where you can get at relatively easily, um, you could click this upload a new template image. It's going to send you the, um, you know, the Azure PowerShell modules and it's going to send you a PS1 script and then it's going to give you a pop-up script that uh, you can dump into that and then it'll browse out and you can upload the VHD from your data center to uh, Azure. So uh, there is the possibility to have built this image yourself in your own data center. In fact, that's what I did uh, the first time. But we're doing this the easier way because we built this thing in Azure. It's already here. We don't have to wait for hours and hours for a, you know, a huge VHD file to upload. Uh, we can just do this from that. Now, there are some gotchas here. If you go and you do it this way here, you need to know a few things. Uh, namely, you have to do your VM as a, uh, a version 1 uh, because Azure doesn't support v2 VMs and you have to create your hard disks your uh, your VHDs as uh, VHDs not VHDXs because those aren't supported you don't have to worry about any of that if you built it in Azure because the VMs were naturally built in Azure and, and therefore 
obviously compatible uh, with Azure. Okay, so uh, what is the virtual machine image that we're going to pick? Well, we've only got the one that we've already built. And it's wanting us to again confirm that we did in fact go through and run the app requirements uh, PowerShell and that we did run the uh, sysprep and um, you know the uh, image validation script and, and stuff like that, which we did. We, we've covered that. So it's just making sure that before it goes to all this work, I want to make sure you did your work so that it doesn't end up having to uh, get 90% of the way through this and have it fail. So we're going to call this remote app one. Um, actually, we'll call it uh, RA one nine Z, and then we're going to move this out of Northern Europe into the South Central U.S. and click OK. And you'll see that it's just uh, starting the import remote app template image to RA nine Z. It's already finished with that. And so now we um, have a, uh, a template that belongs in our uh, image collection. So we can go in here and click new and it's going to go ahead and, and uh, jump us over to creating a new remote app thing. And we're going to do a quick create because we don't need a VPN. And we're going to give this thing uh, a name and this one actually is going to be public facing so I want to uh, make sure I get a, a unique name for it and I don't think I can start with a number and I just must start with a letter so what we would do is RA 9Z1 right and again we don't want this thing placed in uh, Northern Europe we want it in the central US that's where our template is so that's going to be the uh, more uh, uh, the closer data center that has our template already stored in it. Again, we covered the two different kinds of plans, and we're going to go with the standard plan. And it's asking me, you know, what uh, subscription we're going to use, uh, or image we're going to use, rather. And so we've got this one right here that was the Windows Server 2012 uploaded on 3, 9, and that's kind of confusing because it uh, is not actually the... Uh, Wait a minute, that's not the right one. Where's my template? Uh, it. Uh, those are in Microsoft images, not my images, and that's not what we expect to see. So Microsoft gives us two. So just a little bit of uh, background here. Um, as of this video, there is a, um, uh, a trial version that has Office on it on this, uh, you know, standard 2012 and I'm thinking it's still got Office on it. If it isn't on there, then they've already gotten rid of that trial because it was part of the preview. Uh, this would just be a generic uh, 2012 image, and this would be one if you're using Office 365, and if you don't have an Office 365 subscription, that's not going to do you a whole heck of a lot of good. Uh, what we want to use is our own image, and I'm not really sure why we're not seeing our images here, template images. Oh, it's still upload pending. Okay, so it's not ready for us to use. So it's still bringing the um, the uh, uh, template image over from, I guess, whatever other storage blob it was in to this storage blob, which I don't know how uh, long that's going to take, but it will uh, eventually make it here, and then we'll be able to pick the uh, raw 19Z, uh, remote app 19Z image, image during the uh, creation process. So we'll go ahead and pause again, wait for the upload pending to say upload complete and make it an available template image, and we'll move on to the next step. And it has now moved on to import in progress, and that sounds good. It was probably waiting for another queued job to complete before it moved on to my job. Again, I'm not in a uh, normal MSDN. Um, uh, if you're using an MSDN version of Azure, I'm not in the normal one. I'm in a, kind of a rather congested one. So uh, that's why that's doing that. I just want to take just a minute to talk about some feedback. I don't do a lot of uh, return feedback. Uh, most of that I do on my TechNet site. I've had some people ask why in YouTube I'm not answering uh, some of the questions. Honestly, I don't even see them sometimes for a month or so. Uh, like all of you, I have my day job. This is not what I do for Microsoft. This is simply something I do uh, because I, I really passionate about technology and I'm very passionate about sharing what I learn in technology with other people. Uh, so when I have time and I have something kind of interesting that I've done or f learned, I usually will uh, find a way to blog it or make a video on it. Um, I do have a better tendency to get uh, responses out on my TechNet blog and I apologize to anyone who's asked me questions and I didn't even see them on my YouTube channel. Frankly, I didn't even know that uh, questions were being asked on some of those. So if, uh, if that's happened, my bad. 
apologize. I'll try to be better about watching for those uh, questions as they come in. Uh, but like you guys, I've got you know a 12-hour workday a lot of times, and it's hard to get around to that. Also, some of the other feedback I got was you didn't like the background music. Uh, I got quite a few of those. So uh, this video, I'm not putting the background music in uh, behind while I'm talking. I guess that was uh, annoying some people <laughs> uh, listening to. Uh, to that so uh, you know point taken and uh, feedback received uh, what's really funny is if I know anything about um, how this works is I won't have it and then people will be like man that was so dry how come you don't have your background music uh, going anymore I liked that that was cool um, anyway so all right import complete it has finished so theoretically we now should be able to use this um, VM. So we're going to go back in here again and do another quick create and we'll give it a name again and we'll call this once again uh, remote app 9z1 9z1 and move that sucker to central south central US and standard and still don't have an image here. Daggummit what on earth is taking so long for my image to show up um, when, I, when I build this sucker. Why don't you want to show me my why you gotta be da rude, man? All right, so close that. Let's see if we can figure this out. Template images, import complete, and Visual Studio Ultra South Central. Sure looks. Wow, upload date was 18:99. That's at 6 p.m. Even that's wow, that can't be right. Uh, yeah, December 31st, 18:99. <laughs> That's really cool. I don't think we even really had a lot of electricity. It certainly didn't have uh, uh, computers yet. The uh, you know the Altair uh, 8000 wasn't even invented uh, until about 50 years after after that. So seems seems to be a rather old image. Let me um, go in see if there are any options. Rename, delete, and add. That's that's all we get. Uh, yeah, wonderful. All right, so maybe there's a time delay when the images get uploaded uh, till they actually appear in the remote app collection options here. Maybe um, let's uh, let's just assume that that's the case, since we do have a valid template image on here, uh, and it just doesn't seem to be making it over to that other page. So what I'll do is I'll give it a few minutes. If that doesn't work, I'll log out. I'll log back in, and if that doesn't work, uh, we may may have done something wrong here. I may have offended the Azure gods of some way. So uh, pause it and we'll come back. This isn't my normal, uh, normally my uh, let's tech is let's troubleshoot together, but I'm not actually going to be troubleshooting anything since there's really not anything to do necessarily here. I wouldn't even know where to look for that apart from, you know, obviously looking in my storage and seeing, you know, in my blobs and my containers and my VHDs if there are stuffs is there which there is definitely stuffs is there. Um, remote app template is is in here. It's rather small. Doesn't seem like that is the right size. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong one. Uh, there now seems to be two of these. This could be interesting. But what I was trying to say was that normally I would troubleshoot live and what are we looking at here? 2015-04-03. So this definitely is our thing from today. There's no question it, it exists. We've got our, our 127 gig uh, file sitting there. Um, yeah, there's some old stuff that I had from from before. Not even not even uh, yeah, not even deleted yet. Even though the VM doesn't exist anymore. So we've got a template. It's there. Um, so I gotta imagine this is a time delay mechanism designed to make you wonder if you're doing things right or not. Is that still not listed? Okay, well we're gonna give it a few minutes. Uh, come back after if I actually do anything interesting that is troubleshooting related, rather than sit here and just click on stuff. Um, uh, we'll, I will unpause the video for any of that. Otherwise, I'm gonna assume that a uh, a five minute delay or a log out, log back in might fix it and. I'll go ahead and not make you sit here and listen to me drone on about random nothingness. So here goes the buzz. Okay, so evidently it's a combination of just a little bit of patience, but also clicking the right buttons and also making sure, remember this is a web app, so we need to move from one field to another. Uh, so there wasn't actually any troubleshooting to you. You didn't miss anything. I actually came back later and just walked through the whole thing and made sure I did. I think what actually was going on here 
I'll have to replay the video to be sure. When I first start kind of looking through this, you'll see that there is no template that uh, is listed. Uh, so we'll give this uh, add line Z1. Um, we'll change to a different field and come down here. It's still not there. We'll change to South Central US and then change fields back. And there it is. There's our guy, right? We're always going to change that standard, as we mentioned, but now we have the, the field there. So you can only create the template from the same region, uh, the same data center where uh, Azure is running. And so that's uh, probably a good part of what we uh, were missing before, is I just, A, had not given it the minute or so that it needed to get uh, populated. And also, I didn't switch back and forth and make sure I was in the right data center, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so we're going to go ahead and create this remote app application. You'll see that it goes to creating, and we can go to details and actually see all the steps. There are going to be a few, because it's actually kind of um, you know, booting up the VM from the template, uh, more or less making a copy of that, that file. And then it's uh, going to start booting it up. And the provisioning part of booting it up is you know, running through the sys prep and, um, well, first creating the VM, then mounting that uh, VHD, a copy of it, as the hard drive. We've already sys prepped it, so as it boots up, it goes to the mini setup wizard. So basically, Azure is waiting to kind of get the signal from the VM that it's come up to the desktop. And that'll be our next uh, step, so I'll pause until we get to that uh, that phase. All right, folks. Looks like that made it uh, made it f through the process of uh, provisioning. So we now have an active remote app collection, um, and I have the correct mic selected now. Hopefully, so it won't sound like it did a minute ago. Um, Okay, so here we go. We've got the remote app. Um, we got remote app 9Z1. He's up. You'll notice that when I click on him, we've got some to-do list task things that we could do. And you can see publishing a remote app program is uh, highlighted in pretty green. Um, I would actually say don't click this. Click this publishing button up here, where we see the uh, you know the the part up at the top. The reason we want to use that is because there's actually some publishing that we want to do prior to doing regular uh, publishing. I'll explain why. So first, the thing we want to do is program with path. So I'm going to have us do a couple of these because you're going to want to have that at least initially. You might, before you roll this out to your users, it, whoa, uh, sorry, you might want to um, to start off with a uh, a couple of utilities that you're going to use and then maybe remove these later but there's a couple that you're going to want to have you can always get to these through a, a command line interface but the the first one is we're going to want to go ahead and publish uh, mstsc and see colon backslash windows system third and then uh, mstsc.exe and this one will give you the ability to open remote desktop back to your own host. There's probably a couple of other ways you could do that, but this is the cleanest one because it's going to be right there where you can see it. Uh, the other one's going to be command prompt. So we want to be able to get to uh, command prompt at times, and I'll show you a couple of reasons why that. So Windows, again, uh, system32cmd.exe, and there we go. So it should start publishing those. Now we can go through and publish our normal stuff. So you'll see that when I do a uh, publish and do publish start menu programs, uh, when we go through the list of things that are in the remote app programs, uh, you won't see command prompt and you're not going to see uh, a couple of other things that might be very useful to you in a remote app. So if this is a remote app for you, you definitely want to keep the, uh, you know, the remote desktop connection where you can get at it easy and you want to have a command prompt where you can get to it fairly easily uh, because you're going to want to maintenance the box from time to time. And so having those manually published is, uh, is a good thing to do. And why on earth are you not giving me any programmies to publish, silly thing? Um, it is kind of nice. You'll see that it picked up the icons for MSTSC and for command, so we know we got the path in there right. So let's try again for start menu programs. There we go. It just wanted to be persnickety. All right. Um, so 
you'll notice we didn't pin Excel to the start menu, but it found it anyway. So we probably didn't have to go through and get all of these. Uh, but some really handy things to have published, for me anyway, um, in, a, in a situation like this is, I mean, I use Word a lot, and I, I use Link, and I use Outlook for remote app type stuff. Um, somehow command prompts listed here. I don't know if that's because I popped it in there or if uh, they have recently changed this so that that's listed. It was in the past not there. So, um, all right. So that's that's probably good. We've got we've got a few programs that we're going to have listed there. And is there anything else I want to put there? We we did go to all the trouble of putting Firefox on there and whatnot. So we might as well. And everybody loves PowerShell. So let's let's just throw it all in there. Um, anything else we want? that I can think of. Uh, most of the time, if you're, uh, well, Excel, too. Whoa, how about a checkbox? There we go. You know, most of your t uh, time, if you're just going to, like, throw this out there so your users can remote out their email and link and other things of that nature, you know, obviously they may not need to clutter up everything with stuff like their, um, you know, OneNote or Publisher. Not that OneNote, by any means, is a constant utility that I use, um, but clutter it up with a bunch of stuff that they won't need until they open something, right? So if your users primarily open Word documents, not use remote app to, like, author new Word documents, you may not want to publish it there, and then uh, it'll, of course, always launch. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and publish those and get us some stuff uh, listed in the um, uh, remote app connection. So... The next part of this is kind of two pieces, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to go get the software that is required for us uh, to actually access the remote app server. Um, that's actually not the next thing we're going to do, that's the next thing after the next thing we're going to do. The, uh, uh, the, the next piece of this is to make sure we have some information about the uh, server itself. So. Uh, that's the template image. You notice there is no server name here, so that could be a problem, right? Well, luckily for us, we did publish the command prompt, so we're going to look around here, and yeah, there's not really information about what the name of this server is, right? So maybe maybe it is called RA9Z1, and we'll find out in a minute, but um, at, at this point in time, uh, I need to know what the server name is so that I can get in and do some managing. And I'll show you what I'm talking about with that here in just a minute. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go get the actual program that uh, you put on here because a lot of you would probably just do the natural thing, which is go look for remote app and desktop manager. Well, not remote desktop connection manager. How about I type the right program here? Remote, oh, Premote, come on, R E M O T E app and then go down to remote app and desktop connections. This is the built-in Windows remote app and desktop connections. And I'll show you how to connect one. Um, you type in here and you type in the, uh, the actual feed, web feed dot aspects of your traditional remote app and desktops web feed. You'll know about this if you watch my other video on how to set up your own remote app uh, program. Then it's just built into Windows and it just sits here all the time. Azure chose to write their own, so they're not using the one that's actually built into uh, Windows uh, 7 and later client operating systems. They've got one that is uh, ported out, and you can get that from this address that's right there on your dashboard. So you can see it's got an install client button right here. You click that, and it gives you the link to go ahead and download the client, and you'll see that it goes ahead and launches it. Now, you would go through an install process. I do not have to go through an install process because it's already here on my machine, but that's about the only thing uh, that you know, goes beyond uh, what we just did. But there's, you know, there's not a lot of complexity to that, so I won't, uh, I won't waste your time with it. All right, so I'm going to log in, and I'm going to use my uh, handy dandy Azure logon account. helps if you use the right password and bang and it now starts searching for uh, any remote apps that we have so you'll see that the um, MSTSC program that we had and the command prompt and Excel and Outlook and all the happiness is right here so how does this look it looks exactly like it does when you do a uh, connection 
using any uh, you know standard remote app process. So let's start with the command prompt. So you'll see that it goes ahead and launches it. And the only difference here probably than the one that's on uh, the built-in Windows 7 and higher client remote app is that uh, we've already logged in and authenticated, so we're not going to have to log in and authenticate again here. And uh, you get the same show details. You could actually see it logging into the server in the background uh, during this. And actually, if I think, yeah, it's not going to work for, uh, for us. I may have that piece of it locked down. But it's uh, it's beginning its first session. And it's going to take a little longer. There we go, show details. It would take a little longer the first time because it doesn't have my desktop profile set up. You can see it's actually setting up personalized settings before it actually launches the command prompt, uh, remote app, published. Uh, uh, app that we have going here sometime in the near future. There it goes. Okay, so now we're going to type host name, and you'll see that it's not called what I was thinking it was, or what I expected it to from the description. It's called this. So that's kind of like your first step, right? We need to type in host name, find out the name of the actual server that got created when we deployed our template, and then you're going to go into your MSTSC app. Or if you didn't want to publish that, obviously, now that we're a command prompt, you could have just ah, MSTSC and bang. And now we've got two of them, so we're going to go ahead and close that one out. And then we'll uh, go ahead and connect to that at you know a lower resolution so we can actually see what's like going on. And what you're going to log on with, in your case, is whatever username you created the second time not the first one. So in, I, if I remember right, we did it Chris 2 because I screwed up and did a Chris uh, the, on the first one. So that's why I was telling you when you build the image and it asks you for the admin account name, call it Chris 2, well you would call it you know, Susie 2 or whatever, if um, you know, who, who, whatever your name happens to be. And wouldn't that be weird for somebody who was named Susan who was just listening to that in her Okay, sorry, my weird sense of humor. If you do that the first time, then you can name your additional admin account, um, you know, without the two. Put in your password, and now you'll be able to get on the box with admin rights so that you can make uh, changes to this, to update programs, add new programs that you will then publish for your users. Uh, that way you're not having to redeploy your quote-unquote gold image every single time your app that you're publishing to your users uh, gets updated. So there we go. We come in to said desktop. Uh, this also can be very handy if like you need to remote um, in and just run something as administrator. It's always not required to do that, you understand, uh, because you, you do have a command prompt, but you'll notice that this is not a um, uh, an administrative command prompt. Uh, what can I do that would show you that I can't do stuff? Oh, uh, like IP config. Here's an easy one. Flush DNS. It says requires elevation. Well, how do I run this thing as a, uh, an admin? It's not like I can right click command prompt and say run as an administrator. Okay, well, that can be a problem. You'd remote desktop into it and you could run it from there. Or you could do another little trick right here and say start space dot and it'll bring you up an explorer window right here that is actually not running on your machine this is you know windows explorer on the uh, on the server that you're doing maintenance on and now we can right click and say run as administrator whenever you have to answer a uac value you're going to see this rds admin that's built in to all remote app uh, servers that you deploy this is how they're going to keep you up to date it's so that the rds admin account could come in and change your uh, remote desktop licensing server so that it works for you uh, not to expire because that's part of your agreement with azure when you have that you have you know the remote desktop license uh, running on this thing without having to buy extra but you also have your account. If you forget to do this, the only one you'll see is RS, uh, RDS admin, and you won't know how to uh, log in and do UAC prompts because, well, you don't have um, um, admin rights to the box. You don't have the password to that, that account. It may be your VM, but it is not uh, a VM that you have admin rights on. <laughs> so you don't want to cut yourself short. Always create that account. Now we can do IP config flush DNS and it should succeed because we're running this with the administrative token for uh, uh, for that user. You also see something else in kind of bizarre and peculiar. Uh, when I say who am I, we'll see that I'm Chris underscore zero zero zero. When I say who am I here, I'm Chris two. 
So this isn't just dual token, this is a completely separate user. This is the user you used to log on. Um, this is representative for me of the uh, my Windows, uh, my Microsoft account and what got carried over to the account on that machine. I'm authenticating to this server via my, my Microsoft account, um, the same one that I used to log on to my Azure and what you saw me log on to my MSDN page, etc. Uh, this, on the other hand, is the local account that we created and has local admin rights. Okay, so this is this is your way of being able to get in and run things as administrator, so you can keep your VM up to date. You don't actually have to go through like the process of running Windows updates on this. Azure's going to take care of that for you. Um, Azure's going to take care of the you know the licensing server, which you'll notice is not licensed. Uh, but if you ever watch for the prompts when you log in, it'll say it's going to expire in something like uh, uh, 3,652 days or something like that. Uh, basically 10 years. So you're, you're going to be fine with your uh, <laughs> remote up programs on this particular VM for well past the lifetime of the, uh, the virtual machine's uh, supported lifecycle uh, being a Windows Server 2012 R2 server. So there you go. All right, so this is just you as the admin. Uh, you as the user, however, uh, now have your ability to open up your words and your Excels and your PowerPoints and whatever. Let's just do a simple one and open up Word. Word, in my case, is not activated because I didn't go through that uh, first process and I, I haven't done the recommended settings. This is something that you'll have to do the first time, the use recommended settings, and if you don't have an account, you can't. This requires a UAC prompt. Uh, so you can do an ask me later but it, it, you've got to get this going for a user so we say that and guess what you get a UAC prompt if you don't have it word says oh sorry there's a problem I want to activate I know that blah 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 you go through all this you can get there but you don't want your users having to do that every single time they open so you need to get in and do the recommended settings thing at least once so that every time they launch that they don't have to go through that that mess so let me do that again kinda of show you what I'm talking about you don't want to activate right now. No, I guess it doesn't keep doing it. Well, whatever. So, okay, here we go. We have a uh, word that is running as a remote app somewhere out there in the cloud. Then you can get this uh, set up so that you don't have to have it running out of your own data center, which will be nice in my case as well, because I have uh, uh, quite a few servers that have been running in my, my kind of little homegrown data center, which of course is, um, you know, something I have to make sure the hard drives don't die on, I have to make sure that I keep adequate cooling, which is expensive, especially in the summer in Oklahoma where it gets over 100 degrees for 30 days sometimes. Um, lots of air, air conditioning to keep that going that I don't have to worry about. I don't have to worry about my switch dying in the middle of the day, which happens. I don't have to worry about Cox cable going out, which happens. Um, I just have this thing published. It's always running. It's always there. So. Um, what else should we talk about? Oh yeah, um, so your user account, uh, where do we figure that out? Okay, so user access. So this this is where we can go and add additional users. They can be any Windows, uh, anyone with a Windows account. So for instance, my wife who has a uh, uh, Windows Live ID slash Windows uh, Hotmail slash uh, uh, Microsoft account uh, does actually have that registered so I could actually make it so that it's okay for her to log on. I don't have to worry about authentication, I don't have to worry about power swords, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff, I just make sure that her live ID is in here. Now you could you could go through and do this authentication with a domain controller, set the DC up, join this thing and do There's a lot of ways you could uh, set up authentication for this. Um, you can even do a bulk add users right here and, and put a CSV file in for their email addresses, but um, you know, there, there are various ways, I mean, for me, this is easiest if I just use the Windows Live ID, then I'm not having to manage the passwords, I'm not having to reset passwords, it's just, um, you know, a live account. Uh, whereas, let's say, you know, my buddy, you know, Bob Hartley, who is, uh, you know, not signed up with a Windows Live account. I can't give that to him because he's not registered with a Microsoft account. So anyway, that's how we would be able to do some uh, user ads here. And uh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder why that's purple. 
because if you guys watch our gaming videos, you know that she's Purple Girl 9 Z, and wow, uh, she loves purple, and somehow she got purple as her, her color. Oh, okay, Caitlin gets one too. That's really kind of funny. Um, so I guess that that's just uh, additional user color, even though it would be kind of neat they had somehow discovered that was purple. So anyway, we click save. Uh, we're giving Lisa user access. She now has access to my remote app server, and she can open that anywhere from any device um, that um, you know supports that type of thing. And that's, uh, that's that step. The publishing, we already kind of talked about really quickly. We'll cover some of these other tabs. Scale, you know, we, we picked the uh, basic, but somehow, I mean, we picked standard somehow or another. It seems to have thrown us to basic. I don't need to go through and figure out if I did that wrong or if there's a bug in the uh, deployment thing. But this is where you can flip that. Uh, the sessions will tell you how many people are logged on right now. Uh, in this case, it's just one. It's me. I can go ahead and log off, disconnect, or send a message just like you could if it was a, a standard uh, uh, terminal server that you were, you were worried about. The publishing we've already covered. You can uh, publish these. You can also edit them and even put command line parameters around them. So, like, if I were to take the... Uh, the command prompt here and uh, edit that and then you know ping uh, www.bing.com I haven't tested this so it'll be really funny if that actually does work but um, now theoretically if I open command prompt it'll just immediately nope didn't work I don't know, kind of a bummer but you uh, will have some pro oh it's still modifying it <laughs> I didn't give it time it may still not work but we'll give it the uh, we'll give it the old college try here um, anyway other things you can do here obviously are unpublish if you decide you don't want Excel on here anymore I can say goodbye Excel uh, I'm gonna go back to Lotus one two three or VisiCalc or something like that um, you can we've already looked at the edit screen and um, We'll test and see if our little ping. This will be really funny if this actually works. Nah, bummer. Did not work. So um, we did the user access and the dashboard here that will give you kind of some usage uh, statistics and the uh, link to the remote desktop client, as we had mentioned before. And then from the general page up here, when we have this highlighted, you can do update, which means okay, I have a new version of my gold image and I want to replace that with this without kicking all my users off, um, without warning, or go ahead and just kick them off and update it. So if you do have a new image uh, template, the gold image, you've just decided, hey, this is, uh, this is you know, server 2012 R2, but now the new version of server, the threshold stuff is released. I'm going to replace it with that. You build it, you get it up there, you get it going, and you just say, okay, I'm ready, bang. You push this, and it'll, it'll go ahead and take care of that for you using this screen right here. Plus, if we ever decided we wanted to just ditch this whole project, we just hit delete and we can kill that sucker. It'll still be um, capable of coming back, though, because remember we had our uh, template images. You can just redeploy. Uh, the amount of time I had paused was probably about 45 minutes or so um, of, of waiting for that. I uh, uh, had you guys uh, pause doing uh, just a couple of emails and stuff, and when I came back it was done, so I don't know exactly how... Uh, how long it took, but it wasn't too bad. So if you need to redeploy, you got to go through this and then republish your apps, and uh, then of course put your users back in. But it wouldn't be, you know, devastating if you had to ditch it and, and uh, get out of there. Uh, I did not create a virtual network, and I don't think we would need that in most cases. And um, that's pretty much it, really, for the remote app. So again, my video on how to do one in your own data center. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, already been published if you want to go give that a uh, try if you want to try doing this in the cloud I hope this has been really helpful to you so anyway guys this has been Chris with Microsoft and as always thank you so much for watching if you did find anything about any of this useful or interesting please give me a quick like uh, also feel free to subscribe to my channel so you'll be up updated and notified when I have anything new uh, that I post out there. Also, my blog is at 9z.com. It's, it's really easy to remember. It's just the last number and the last letter dot com. Uh, that's also got links to my Facebook, my LinkedIn, my Twitter, etc. And uh, so then again, thanks a ton for listening, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.